morning, morning Dublin. Um, so today I want to talk about building an accessible community. Um, let's just check. So the lighting is really bad and have bad eyesight. Yeah, it's on. Um, so my name's Jenny and I am a community addict, um, self-confessed. I go to far too many conferences a year just because I really like people and hanging out with people. Um, and I had the luxury of organizing a lot of events as well for my local um, WordPress and PHP predominantly communities. Um, so that's a lot where a lot of my e experience comes from. Um, and last year, this year, 2016, we're still in the same year. 2016, I um, was the lead organizer for WordCamp London, um, which was the first time I've ever been a lead organizer of an event. So that was really, really cool. And today I want to share with you the story behind some of the things we did about making our event accessible. Um, I realized that sometimes when we talk about communities, we actually think about online communities. Um, and obviously my talk is gonna be about an offline community, but I do believe that a lot of the things I'm gonna say today, you can actually use for an online experience and an online community, as well as you know your own companies and the, any community that you're a part of. So let's get right to it. Now, it's no secret that when we talk about our industries, whichever industry you're on, a lot of times we talk about diversity. I mean, we're in AlterConf, so <laughs> I think the name goes with that, um, which is really cool and it is super important. But when it came to WordCamp London, I didn't want to talk about diversity. Um, partly because I've been to too many conferences which have done it wrong or just really made me upset. Um, so, ooh, Microphone doesn't like going down. Okay, um, so instead I wanted to talk about inclusivity. Um, and the two are very similar, but actually very different. Um, I wanted to make WordCamp London the most accessible and inclusive event possible. The idea being that, well, when you're looking at diversity, you're trying to bring people from all sorts of lives, but when you're inclusive, my mindset at least thinks, I just want to welcome everyone who is knocking on the door, period. The door is wide open. I'm making sure that door is wide open as big as possible. Um, but first things first, you can't organize an event on your own. Well, you can, but it's a lot of hard work. Trust me, you don't want to do it. Um, so get a gang of organizers who buy into the whole concept. Um, I was very, very lucky. Uh, my organizing team, when I told them my grand plan, they were like, yeah, this makes sense. Let's go for it. Let's try it. So how do you make a community inclusive? When you decide that you don't want to look at diversity and you want to look at inclusiveness, drop the hint a few times because I keep on using the wrong word, but accessibility is the core of that. At least that's what we found. Um, by insisting that everything was accessible for anything, um, it really helped us to decide on things. Were we gonna have peanuts or not, for example? It was an accessibility question. Now, when it comes to accessibility and putting it at the core of your event and everything you plan, um, the budget that you have or the size of the event does not matter. There will be things that you can't afford to do or you just don't have the space to do, but you just do your best. And the fact that you try is way better than a lot of things. So don't worry about your budget or your size. Um, I've actually put in the cost of the event and um, the th things that we did so you can see what, um, how much it, we had to spend on this stuff. So let's get to it. First and foremost, content. Content is free because we have to write content anyway, so there is no extra charge when writing content. So when you're thinking about content and making content accessible, think about the wording you're using. Um, I think this event is a great example of that. Whenever you're writing, especially any content where you're doing call for sponsorships, call for speakers, use gender neutral pronouns just everywhere. And um, what I found was that instead of making assumptions, we just made no assumptions and therefore using they and them just meant we didn't really care. And it's kind of a subliminal thing where people just don't read the gender that you're looking for, um, which equalizes the playing field. Think about the tone of voice when you're putting on and working with your community and the community that you want to build. So for us, we created WordCamp London to almost be a 
a personality, a, a person. Um, and WordCamp London 2016, every year it changes, will have a different tone of voice, a different personality that we build and make. The other thing that we um, looked at was <laughs> we, when we were talking about accessibility is understand the different lingo between different things. I'm not part of the hard of hearing community, so I kept on using the wrong terminology when I was referencing deaf, hard of hearing, STTRs and all sorts. And it took somebody from the outside community to come to me and say, hey, you're using the wrong terms, could you change them? And this is a glossary of what it means. So learn from my mistake and look up the actual correct wording or ask somebody who is part of that community. Lots of people will help you. When it comes to imagery on your events or wherever you're, you're advertising, um, show what you want to see. Don't use photos of things you are actually not interested in. So if I go to, and the PHP community is especially bad for this, but they'll talk a lot about beers, have pictures of socials with beers, and it really, really annoys me because I have no interest in getting wasted with my peers. So instead, show what you want to see. If you want to see a social which has people having conversations, show a picture with people having a conversation. It seems really obvious when you say it out loud, but when you're organizing things, it's really easy to miss these things. Also, proofread. Um, consistency is key across your board. Remember that personality. Childcare. So childcare cost 2,000 odd pounds last year. It was for 10, pe um, 10 people, I guess they are people. Um, for <laughs> just very small people. Um, it actually went up to, so we could take in anyone from zero to, um, I think it's 17. Um, um, yeah, and it cost £2,000. Um, and it all stemmed from one of our speakers from the year before, who originally was a new speaker. She couldn't um, go to the event, so she's asking about childcare. And if any of you know me, which I don't think many of you will, my, my go-to response is, well, if you're willing to organize this thing, then you can do it and we'll do it. I'll give you the money. Um, <laughs> things I learned on the way. Don't do it yourself because childcare and law is very, very painful. Find professionals. Always find professionals. Um, I don't want to be responsible for other people's children. <laughs> you do not want to be responsible for other people's children either, trust me. <laughs> um, also vet the professionals, just finding them isn't good enough. You want people that you actually trust. Trust is a big thing, especially with parents. Um, having a parent, so Joe is a parent with two children, uh, and having them vet them as well. Like parents have to vet childcare day in, day out. So they are like, they've got a gut of like parenting things. I don't have that. Let the parents deal with that. Um, <laughs> Also meet these people in person because ha talking to someone online and talking to someone offline is a completely different experience. I'm sure you have all experienced this before. Sometimes it's similar, a lot of the time it's different. Get testimonials and follow through with them because people can make up testimonials. We all know this. We all make fake data for our websites when we're uh, doing things. Um, I work in an agency, that's why I do that. <laughs> uh, Encourage attendees to check it out as well. So on the day, um, WordCamp London 2016 was the first year that we actually did this. And we, had, we, we sent out a survey asking people if they would be interested, partly because I wanted to hope that we needed a bigger room and it was all about size of the room. Fun fact, in the UK, a child needs a certain amount of space per, um, a room space per child. It's quite fun. It's kind of like cattle. It's really weird. Um, <laughs> It, I, I've learned so much. Um, yeah, so, but what we found when we did the survey was parents weren't very keen on using the childcare service um, because they didn't know who it was, what to expect, what kind of things would be there. They didn't know, you know, what would be provided. So in year zero, as we called it, we asked the um, crash service if it would be okay if parents came along and checked the space out, especially when the child, like, any children were not there. Um, we only had one registered child for the crash. Um, so it was 2,000 pounds of childcare for one child, best childcare ever. <laughs> um, but what it meant was that 
At the end of the conference, we declared that we would be using the same childcare service for the next year, for 2017. And by doing that, it meant there was continu continuality. Is that a word? I think it's a word. Um, so by doing that, it allows people to feel at ease about using your childcare service. When you're changing childcare service all the time, they don't know what to expect. So by setting a standard and saying, this is what we have, we've had a good experience with them, you've all checked it out, we would love to see more children in there so we can grow this and make this a uh, thing that is consistently in our event. Um, it gives people trust. It makes them trust you. And also, pretty much all the parents have direct numbers to this Quest service now, so it's great. They can just ask them directly any questions they have. Um, obviously, when it comes to 2017, we are going to re-vet them. We are going to go through the whole process again because things can change within a company. So you need to do this year on year. Don't just assume what happened last year means what happens next year will be the same. You still just want to make sure you sanity check things. Space planning. Now, in the UK, we're pretty lucky. I know I'm not in the UK, um, but in the UK, and I think in a lot of places across the world, when you have um, spaces like open um, public spaces, we're quite lucky in the sense that certain things are required by law. Um, wheelchair access is required by law in lots of places, especially if you're an open um, space. Not that I know, not that everywhere has decent wheelchair accessibility, so make sure you check that out and um, just walk around and make sure that is actually working. Also, hearing loops. Um, we're pretty lucky at Workout London, we actually hold our event at a university, so all our theatres have hearing loops, but there is a thing called technology. And technology has this lovely way of breaking on the day you need it. So make sure you check it as like, early as possible and also as late as possible. So the day before your event, and also even on the day in the first thing in the morning, making sure these things work, um, just because technology. Um, and I don't trust universities on their technology, simply. <laughs> um, but there are other things as well when it comes to space planning that we can do. And if you're lucky and you have the space and capacity, you can do these things. Multi-faith rooms. If you're looking at universities especially, or places which have or ho um, hotels, hotels and airports. Surprisingly, in certain countries, they use airport facilities um, to host events, which is really cool. They, if they have large amounts of people going in and out of these spaces, they are likely to have a multi-faith room. Um, so ask, and if there isn't a multi-faith room already set up in the vicinity of the venue, then just set aside a private room, call it a multi-faith room, and tell people about it. Now, when you do this, and especially if you're making a makeshift multi-faith room, um, inform, when you inform people that you're having a multi-faith room and it's a, a, it's an, a facility for them to use, tell them that it is a makeshift private room so they know to bring their equipment with them. That's really, really important for certain religions. If you don't have the facility for a multi-faith room, one thing you can do is find the local religious buildings around the area and point them out. Because sometimes all it takes is five minutes for them to run to their um, faith building and then come back and that will so solve that problem. So if they know where they are, it's a great helpful resource to them. And that doesn't mean that you have to do anything except for put some content on your website. Lactation room. There is no point of having a crash if you're not gonna actually look after the parents too. Um, one thing we did last year was put the lactation room in a different part of like the corridor instead of putting it next door. And we had the childcare serve crash um, next to the green room, which was such a bad idea. So pro tip, put the lactation room as close to the crash as possible. But also in a lactation room, all you really need is a table, a chair. That will be nice for someone to sit down on. But also some bottles of water and tissues. Um, usually, you know, the 500 milliliter bottles of water, um, apparently, I don't know, but apparently lactation takes a lot of, of liquid and they need to replenish themselves, so it's quite useful. Also, the reason why you have bottles of water and not a jug with um, glasses is because um, mothers will use the bottle to drink the water from and then actually, because it's a sterilized bottle, to then use to put the uh, milk in. 
So that's really, really handy, especially if they don't realize how much they need and stuff like that, or they need to run around finding this stuff, just have it there for them. Um, I tend to go for the 500 millimeter Buxton waters um, because they apparently are the perfect size. Um, I get this from good sources, which are basically my colleagues. <laughs> um, and also tissues because I can imagine it being messy, so I just put tissues in there. In fact, putting tissues all over your conference, wherever you think someone might cry or need to blow their nose, is really, really cool. Because um, I always find myself without tissues. Also have a quiet room. Um, my other half, bless him, is um, the complete opposite of me. And as you meet me today, you'll understand what I mean. Um, and one of the things we did was we went to FOSDEM in Brussels um, two years ago. Um, and it's crazy. It's like thousands of people everywhere. And I've never really felt like um, an introvert, but that was the one day I understood what my other half goes through day in, day out. Um, when you have crowds and crowds of people and you're just like, give me somewhere to hide and to get my breath back. Um, luckily, FOSDEM did have a quiet room. I managed to find it. Um, it wasn't well signed, but that's a different topic. Um, having a quiet room, it's kind of like a, um, the quiet carriage and in trains where everyone is not allowed on their phones and you don't make too much noise. Um, really, really helps for people who just need to take five minutes to get themselves back together. And it's not just for introverts. Extroverts also have a bit of introvertsy in them, so they also appreciate it. It's also a really good place to go and run and hide um, when you just don't want to talk to anyone because if someone tries to talk to you, you just, press, you just like point at the fact it's a quiet room and then you just can't talk to them. Every trick in the book today. Um, green rooms for speakers. Having somewhere to go and panic about their talks is a must, as far as I'm concerned, because otherwise I'm very, very rude before my talks. Um, sprint rooms for people who want to have a, to do work, um, but not have people constantly barging in, going, what are you doing? It's kind of nice. It's not necessary, but it's just nice making all these things because especially at tech conferences when people are on call, they still want to come to your event but they can't guarantee that they can be there full time. Being on call, making sure they have a phone with them so if so anything does happen they can just run to the sprint room and get on with the job. It's kind of nice and handy for them. Media room for anyone doing media. Breakout spaces just so that you can mingle and talk and feel like you don't have to be in the main tracks when necessary. Um, I should have pointed out, Workout London is 660 people, so that's why a lot of these things are for big, big events. Um, overflow areas, super important. Don't plant anything in them. People will naturally do things and organically use them, which is kind of handy. Signage. Um, we spent a lot of money on signage, um, 3,500. In fact, now I realize it, this is more money than this daycare. Uh, <laughs> Partly because it was all done within 48 hours and then um, put on a motorbike and then expressed across London for us. Um, pro tip, do this beforehand, as in <laughs> lots of months beforehand, um, and it would probably cost a lot cheaper, but it was worth every penny. Signage is one of those things you shouldn't really skimp on. Um, here's a picture of the signage, of some of it. It really builds an atmosphere for your event. So the lunch hall has five five or six meter ceilings. It's insanely tall. It's one of those old gym buildings, so the, the ceiling's just crazy high. Um, so what we did was we spent 100 pounds on bunting um, <laughs> and lowered the concept of the ceiling down so it just felt more homely and a bit nicer and a better, better atmosphere for everyone. And also, it enables self-support. You will need more signage than you think. Just trust me on that. It's really important for people, especially autistic people, to have that self-support. They don't want to be asking you questions every two seconds. And trust me, your volunteers don't want to be answering the questions every two seconds either. So having clear signage of where things are means that they can like, know where they are all the time. Also, if you turn a corner and you can't see any signage, you probably need signage there. Make sure you brand them. Because branding's really important. I was recently at the UN. I did not know which signage was for which event. So please brand them. Make them bright and eye-catching because that way your eye immediately sees it because that's really, really helpful and actually lowers the amount of time you start panicking. Use a reading-friendly font. Um, if you look at the 2016 WordCamp site, it's really, really bad. 
for anyone with any dyslexia because the reading, the font that we picked by the designer is not reading friendly. We know this is a problem. Please don't do what we did. Use a reading friendly font. Um, if you're not sure what that means, Google it because it's a whole entire talk completely. Whenever we thought, when you're walking around an event, whenever you think it's going to be A4 size that you need, just make sure that it's A3 instead because when you have people, it just needs to be bigger. Also make this, the actual text bigger as well because there's people like me who have really, really short sightedness and it's really, really handy to be able to read something across the room, especially when you're like in a crowd. Hang above head level. Not everybody is six foot and I'm five foot two, so I totally understand what this means. Um, so hang it basically above there and if someone can only reach the bottom, then you've got it about right. Signage takes up more time than you realize to put up. I mean, it probably took us about three hours and I accounted for an hour to do the signage to pull it up. So just be careful of that as well. Um, Pre-organize the signage to make it easier. Make sure you have some blank signage. Some chisel tip marker pens to be able to write on the actual blank signage. And make sure your volunteers have a t-shirt because when, especially in big events, um, you just can't see who it is that you're meant to go and bother and you feel bad asking every other person. I've got five minutes or 10 minutes to go through the rest. Um, this is gonna go a bit quicker, I'm sorry. I'm gonna try and not waffle too much. Scheduling. I really, really hate it, especially at big multi-track events when they do five minute um, turnovers. Um, I have an ankle injury that's reoccurring, um, and I was in Vienna, it was 2,000 odd people, three rooms, two different buildings, and scorching hot heats. I could not get from one building to the other within under five minutes without injuring myself. In fact, I did end up re-injuring myself, and it was a pain. It's not just about wheelchair users. It is as important for them, but it's also people with injuries. They might not be obvious. I don't wear my ankle bracelet all the time because my doctor tells me that it's a bad idea. Um, it's also for people who have children or people who just want a five minute breather in the quiet room. And also, let's remember, when we have bunches of people in a room, the room easily gets really smelly. So it's also important to think about what I call the back of house lunch, which is for all your volunteers, all your organizers, all your sponsors. Let them go and get food before and after the main lunch period so they don't have to run around like headless chickens. It's really nice to consider these things when you're scheduling. Live captioners, who are actually called stenographers, or as I call them, STTR people. Um, I'm really bad with long words. Um, this is actually probably the most expensive accessibility thing we spent at WordCamp London, 5,000 and a bit pounds. Um, now, when I first announced that we were going to have people live captioning the event, a lot of people said to me, why, that's a lot of money for the fact that people are writing out words. In fact, we had one person who suggested that we could use, um, was it Apple dictation? No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. It's really important, <laughs> just trust me on this, but if you don't believe me, hard of hearing people, not everyone considers themselves hard of hearing, but then when you add accents on top of that, or somebody who speaks really fast, like me, <laughs> It really, really helps. Also something that one of my colleagues recently mentioned was somebody who speaks quietly or when the AV is bad. Um, sometimes it's not the fact that someone is hard of hearing, but rather the room is too echoey. They just want to make sure they sanity check what's going on. Live captioning really, really helps. There are extra AV considerations. You need a table for them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's worth it. One thing that did get requested this year, which we didn't do, was have a secondary monitor for the speakers, especially at the front, because if you have someone asking questions who they can't hear or didn't really understand the question fully, it's really nice to be able to see it written. Now, bathrooms. The cost was 50 pounds for us, um, and I'll explain why in, in a second. Um, at this event, we have degendered bathrooms. At WordCamp London, we did not degender our bathrooms. Please, please, please be aware of local planning regulations and laws before you degender the bathrooms. Um, the 
best thing to think about is the stores. So if you're in a school especially, or if you're in a space that you're not the only event, you need to think about these things. So for the stalls, if the bathroom stall does not go from floor to ceiling, no, floor to ceiling, <laughs> might need more coffee in a second, um, then there is the risk of somebody being a peeping Tom. You cannot guarantee that every attendee is going to be nice and friendly. We like to think it's not going to happen, but you have to prepare for the worst. Um, talk to your venue managers, especially at high schools where they have very strict rules on bathrooms for the kids. It's really important that you actually work with the venue managers. We spent money on life essential boxes. That's where that £50 come from. They look like this. They were in every female bathroom. Um, and it's basically an open lid and a personal note. It has tampons and towels of different sizes in it and dailies. And pro tip, because I didn't realize they'll be so popular, have extras to refill. Um, this was one of the biggest things that the women at the event really appreciated. I actually found out one of our speakers ended up on her special time at the event, forgot her bag of toiletries. It was at the hotel, it was further down the road. She was in a panic and goes in the bathroom thinking, oh no, what am I gonna do? And then realizes there was a box there. If places do have sanitary towel machines, but then you have to find money for it or coin, or then you have to try and work the machine, which are always a pain in the, yeah. So just, <laughs> trust me, just put them in a box and make it really easy for us just to pick them out. It's really, really nice. So, so nice. Um, Tickets, the cost of changing the way you ask for tickets is free. Ask for dietary requirements during this time. If you're in an event like at work camps where they think you're gonna always get swag, make them accept the fact that there, there might not be any swag. It gives you a you know, danger-free way of getting out of that situation when they start going, but we have no swag. Um, Ask if anyone needs sign language, ask if people need childcare, any kind of accessibility questions, just ask them there. I mean, people are gonna buy a ticket anyway. Um, Work Camp London had 30 pound tickets, so it was a really low cost event. Also have a box which says any other requests. You'll be surprised at the kind of things will come in and the reasons behind them. So take every single request seriously. Opening remarks. Now, at events, we bring in different cultures together so this is opening remarks are the opportunity to set the tone of the event. It also empowers your, your other organizers and volunteers to know what you expect from your attendees and from everyone at your event. Also, during turnovers, have slides that enforce that as well. Remind people, be nice, remind people they have a quiet room and where it is. That's a great place to have that opportunity to share where things are. When it comes to speakers, and especially in tech, we always want to um, encourage new speakers and get a more diverse, in, diverse speaker roster. But it starts before that. Try doing a call for topics first, if you can. Also outreach to as many places as possible after you've got the results from the call for topics and publish them. Then you can do the outreach. Talk to people and say, hey, have you thought about speaking? I know you know stuff about this topic, I've heard you before. Lots and lots of outreach. We had all of our team doing outreach for two weeks, nonstop. We had apply to speak sessions on Google Hangouts where people come, come together and we would talk to them about the speaking process, what they would get and how to apply and just supporting them all the way along that line. We always made a point to say we were not guaranteeing anybody's slots by them coming along because we don't want to do favoritism. We told people about our speaker mentorship program we have one-to-one -one sessions with new people um, and also group mentors for anyone who's spoken before. And also encourage the mentors that you do get to do the speaking mentor to come along by giving them a free ticket so they are actually in the room with their new speaker giving personal support for that person. It's all about confidence building. We had virtual green rooms and physical green rooms. And we also had a dedicated speaker organizer, which meant that any questions, it was like, go and speak to Diane. Um, also meant that she knew everything about everyone. We had speaker information packs. Um, AlterConf was really cool. They sent me a speaker information um, email, which I could just easily read because I forget everything. Um, 
I do recommend, especially if you have people coming from abroad or don't have data service, to make a downloadable PDF format so they can just save it to their phone as well or print it out. Last but not least, socials, the bane of my life. Um, <laughs> socials, I would prefer if are non-alcoholic centric. It doesn't mean that there's no alcohol in them. And in fact, the WordPress community had a whole hoo-ha about this. Um, so when you're looking at non-alcoholic centric events, you need to also cater it by setting up the event to cater for that. Eat before you drink. It makes sense, especially in a country, as in the UK, where we have a binge drinking problem. Um, eating before you drinking means that we can ensure that people have food in their stomachs lined. Drink tokens were only given out, so free drink tokens were only given out after they got their evening meal. In fact, they had to go and get their evening meal, and then once they had their tray with their, with their food in it, we gave them the tickets for the drink tokens. This ensured that the responsibility of drinking responsibly, we had done our part as organizers. Also give attendees something to do. It's kind of nice, people want to social, people want to network. So we had retro games. It only cost 300 pounds for these retro games to come to London from Birmingham. So I will happily give out that detail to anyone who's doing an event in the UK. Um, but give them something to do, board games, whatever. Um, no cards against humanity, <laughs> just no. Um, we actually had a adult only area for that because I was just like, I am not being part of that conversation. Um, drink menu posters, make it easy if you're having drink tokens so people know what they actually have. Put the non-alcoholic drinks at the top. I'm sorry, but if you wanna do a non-alcoholic centric event, then obviously the emphasis should be on non-alcoholic drinks. So put those at the top instead of at the bottom, which says, and soft drinks, what soft drinks? Make sure at your social events there are quieter spaces to talk. Not everyone wants to go home with a broken voice. This was the cost of it. I don't think it's actually a lot of money. Um, as always, catering was the most expensive thing. There is a lot more that you can do, but I hope you have some ideas from what I've said so far. Accessibility, if you pull it as a first class citizen, it really helps your event. Also set the expectation. Tell people what to expect, but also tell people what not to expect. If you can't do something, that's fine. Just set that expectation so they can um, work around that. Any improvements to our community are better than no improvements. This was my team. They were the best bunch in the world, so I always include a photo of them. And if you have any questions, because I know I'm running a tiny bit late, you can ask me, Layla. I'm going to be here all day. Thank you.